All right, well, I'm just going to quickly talk today about um, visual aids, visual slides. They're all <laughs> the same thing. It's what sits beside you or behind you to, uh, to support your presentation. And I'm approaching it um, from a visual graphic point of view, okay? I'll give you a bit of background about what I do. So I'm a graphic designer. I studied visual communications in the National College of Art, class of 2000. Um, my work spans a range of areas. There's um, presentation design, but I also uh, work in digital design, websites, digital product design, usually on a user interface or front end. Uh, from a front-end perspective. Um, I also uh, create brand identity or visual identity or corporate identity. It's all the same thing for people that can encompass designing a logo, working on a corporate message, a brand personality, all of this kind of stuff. Um, but typically it's all expressed visually. Uh, I also design reports and documents for people. So um, that typically involves the design of infographics uh, presenting a message in dense text format. Um, sometimes I work in uh, spatial design, wayfinding, signage, you might call it. You know, where we work with architects or companies to uh, to to put information into a space to give, whether it's for instructions or to give it a sense of an, an atmosphere or a personality. Uh, but going back to presentation design, oops. Um, yeah, this is the kind of area I. Uh, spend most of my uh, time working on these days um, and you guys will know when you when you approach a presentation there's a lot of different aspects you have to consider okay there's the big picture you know who am I presenting to uh, what, what am I trying to get from them how am I going to present and there's the smaller details which we're going to focus on today which is things like slides PowerPoint messages data I'm going to have to present, how I'm going to wrap that up in a presentation, so uh, colors and visuals and imagery and so forth. So that's what we're going to focus on today, okay? Um, so as I said, this is about visual aids, other known, otherwise known as slides. Um, there's lots of different tools you can use to present your messages visually uh, through the digital medium. These are just some of them, but there's hundreds if not thousands out there. There's also the, the kind of tried and tested method of presenting sometimes, flip chart, <coughs> drawing your presentation as you go. I've seen some of the best presentations ever on a napkin in a restaurant, you know. So the point I'm trying to make is that all of these tools are great and they're all very sophisticated and they all roughly do probably the same thing, give or take one or two strong points, okay? But at the end of the day, they're only a vessel for con containing your message and your, your ideas and your story, okay? So people often ask me, what's the best presentation software to use? Listen, PowerPoint is ubiquitous. Every organization, every client will typically have it. So if you need to send them a presentation, it's a kind of no-brainer to possibly build your slides in PowerPoint. But it has a bad <coughs> reputation. There's a term, death by PowerPoint. Everybody's heard that. I think it's kind of unfair. PowerPoint isn't the most elegant piece of software in terms of how to use it learning how to use it, but it does a lot of stuff really well and it's really compatible with pretty much every PC on the planet, you know. Uh, I typically use these three, PowerPoint and Apple Keynote and sometimes Google Slides, um, but that's my own preference because they're usually uh, interchangeable or they can be shared with people in different ways, okay. But um, the most important thing to remember about your presentation is to make it clear so think of the audience, they don't want to sit and listen to your waffle in detail, you know, if, if it's not clear. Um, make it compelling, you know, so make sure the story is kind of interesting, you know, make sure it's clear what you're asking people to do, because every presentation has a kind of call to action, as they would say, so make sure that's all very, very clear. And also, make it memorable, if you're going to do it, you know, put your back into it, make it as good as presentation as you can make it, okay? If it's, um, if it's huddled together, your audience will sniff that out straight away, okay? So, um, in a way, presentation and the art of giving presentation is almost like theatre. So if you walk into a theatre and the actors on stage fly through the lines, don't really give it look like they're giving a damn. If 
the audience is going to fall asleep, and that's that's death by PowerPoint. That's the situation you want to try and avoid. Okay. So to kind of fire on into some of the detail about um, how you start your presentation. The first thing is always to create a plan, okay? So if this, for example, was a, uh, an overview of your slides, your, your presentation is in essence a story. So like every story, it should have a beginning, middle, and end. So before you get into the detail of fonts and colors and cool images or, or all your impressive data, consider how you're gonna bring somebody from the starting point, which is generally, I don't know who you are, I don't really care, why are you wasting my time, to the point where they've heard what you're doing, about what you're doing, they've got your pitch, or they've, they've received your data and your insights, and how do you get them on board, okay? So plan at a very high level before you start, and then you can start going into details where you might start to look at, okay, well, how do we break our story into chapters? And I typically work quite rough like this, you know, sometimes on a wall with post-it notes, or sometimes in a sketchbook, or just on my phone, you know, but I don't go, I don't hit PowerPoint usually until I've at least worked out some of these structural details, you know. And this can always, it should always be fluid, but you should always at least have some sort of a roadmap for your slide deck before you start getting into details of slide one and working slide one up to a point where you feel it's perfect before you even consider slide two. Work quickly, work rough, work nimbly, move stuff around. Don't be precious about anything you've done because at the end of the day, you know, even up until the last 10 minutes of coming into this room to give this presentation, I was ditching slides, I was moving slides around, I was editing content, you know. The people give presentations and they're often working in, on the presentation in the taxi on the way to the client's venue. And that's the way it works. It's a, it can be a high pressure, high stress environment to work in. And as you guys will know, nobody likes getting up on stage and giving a presentation, especially when they don't fully believe in the story that they're doing. So do as much planning. And as I said, work kind of at a high level, work nimbly, move quickly as you work through your slides, okay? So that's a kind of an overview of the, um, the story from beginning to end, okay, and how it breaks down. When we look at some of the details of when you get to look at your slides, typically slides are broken into two areas. There's usually a heading space where you'll give people some sort of a signifier as to what the idea behind the overall slide is. And then there's your content area, and this is where you drop in the important information, whether it's your data or your your message or your statement or whatever it happens to be, okay? Another key thing that I always tell people to watch out for is um, safe areas on the slide, okay? So um, this is typically the area, you know, here we have a nice projection screen, but you can see there's certain things that start to block the actual projection. If somebody's sitting in that chair there, there's actually a pillar here that can block part of the slide deck. So. The point I'm making is beware of going right to the end of the slide with your important information. Keep it in the safe area. It's no different to a printed page. If you're pre presenting a document or printing out your report on paper, if the text is too near the edge, there's a chance it's going to be missed or it's going to go off page. So always give yourself safe zones to work within. And particularly you notice that when you're in an auditorium, especially if it's on a flat level like this, uh, somebody sitting at the back is generally going to have to see overheads and hairdos to try and see what's on the bottom of the slides. So you need to try and keep that in mind whenever you're laying out your slides, because I'm more often than not I've seen presentations where the people in the back row are constantly doing this, they're standing up because there's a key piece of insight or data in the bottom right hand or bottom left hand corner. And if people can't see that, you know, you're wasting your time. So just be very careful of that. So that's a general view of um, planning and structuring your slides before you get into anything visual. Next point we can look at is actually looking at the details of what goes on the slide and the design, the visual elements of it, okay? There's a famous statement called, um, by a guy called Paul Wozalnik, you cannot not communicate. So everything you do in the presentation is interpreted, is read by your audience. <coughs> and unfortunately, it's, it's even how you appear in your presentation, so if you turn up, your presentation in your pajamas, it sets a tone. So 
everything you bring into the room with you will have an impact on the success or the non-success of your presentation. So just be aware of that. In terms of your slides, everything you do on a slide as well has an impact to how the presentation goes, okay? So um, the choice of details, such as fonts and colors, all has significance whether it's cultural, whether it's literal. So just be aware of that as well. You know, you need to always be aware of all the, the connotations of everything you put on the slide, okay? So nothing really should be arbitrary. Everything on your slide should have a point, should have a message behind it. Because your audience will all have different backgrounds, they'll all have different histories, and they'll be reading different things into your presentation, okay? We'll start with um, typography. So. Typography, some of you may or may not be familiar with the term, but it's it's everywhere, it's in signage. You walk down Graffin Street today, you're probably gonna be hit by about you know five thousand typographic messages as you walk down Graffin Street. Some of them are almost invisible to you because you know you've seen them fifty times, you recognize it in an instant, or you're not interested in it. But there's messages, typographic messages out there all the time trying to communicate to you. They're on the walls in here, they're even on the signage on the machinery we have, you know, and they're on people's clothes. So you're seeing typography everywhere, and a lot of people, it's funny, see it but don't actually have a name for it, or they don't actually understand the principles behind it, but there's, there's strong uh, and tested principles behind typography that I studied in, in college, um, and designers every day will, will work on to get things to work properly, you know, but as I said, most people don't even realize that it's there, it's almost invisible. In terms of some of the definitions, so a typeface is a set of one or more um, fonts composed of characters that share a common design feature. So Times New Roman is a typeface, Arial is a typeface. Arial comes in a range of bold, italic, skewed fonts, Roman standard type fonts. So that would be called a typeface. A font, on the other hand, is a particular setting of that typeface. So, Arial set at nine point size uh, in italic is a particular font within that typeface. And listen, I won't bore you to death with the terminology, but it's important to get a sense of what it is. Because you will hear it from time to time, and you, you encounter it every day, so it's good to have a bit of background of what that is. Typography, then, is the art and technique of arranging that type in a space uh, to make it legible, readable, and appealing when displayed. So. You know, the, the logos on your t-shirts have been considered by a designer to make them clear, to make them interesting, to make them legible, uh, to make them stand out as well. Uh, and you may not think that, you know. Um, so an example of typography would be Arial 9 point set in red colour on a white background, aligned left with 14 point line spacing, you know. So that gives you a sense of the kind of the aspects that typographic, typographic designers or designers or yourself will, will have to consider when you're creating presentations, okay? And we all know there's millions of typefaces out there and they're grown by the day and some of them are fantastic, some of them uh, you'll see all the time, some of them are new, some of them have different personalities and characters. Um, but when we bring that into the space of presentation design, there's a couple of pitfalls you've got to watch out for, okay? So, within a, even a small sample of fonts, there's a particular set of fonts that will only work in PowerPoint when you send your PowerPoint file to somebody else. And it's the same in all the Microsoft Office suite uh, products, whether it's Microsoft Word. If you go and design your document or your presentation using Lightboss, for example, in 15 point, and you send it to somebody in head office in the States, there's a good chance they don't have that font on their computer, so it's going to default to a different font. And the, that's all fine, they'll still see the characters that their machine is defaulting to, but there's a chance then different fonts at different sizes and scales, some are wider, some are taller, even though they might be both described as nine point, some have different characteristics and what that can, have, that can tend to lead to is fonts will break off the page and you tend to get cropping of your message, and that's death by PowerPoint again, you know, where somebody gets your presentation and they can't read all of your content because the font is default. So it's the sort of thing that makes presentation design, the work that I do, unattractive to most graphic designers because there's a, basically a set of handcuffs on you uh, when you get to designing your slides with typography, okay? So I'd love to design slides with 
all the latest trendy fonts, but I'm usually restricted to about 10 or so fonts that I can use so that I can be sure that when I go to present my work, or if I go to a conference center and uh, hand my presentation to somebody on, on a memory stick, and they plug it into the, the, the conference center PC, that they're not gonna be asking me, where's the font? And I'm saying, well, I haven't got it, because I've designed a custom font, you know? So just be aware of that. The typical ones to be safe with are Arial, the really boring ones, Times New Roman, uh, Courier New, Georgia, Calibri, they're usually set in your uh, Microsoft Word uh, application, so just don't go off on a tangent with wacky fonts because there's a danger you'll be stunned on the other side when you have to present. Okay. So this is a, a typical uh, display of a typographic layout of a message that could be a slide presentation. Okay, So there's a clear hierarchy when you start from top to bottom. In this part of the world, Messages are read from top to bottom and left to right, okay? It varies depending on culture. But without me having designed much on this slide, you can clearly see there's an order, there's a hierarchy of information. The heading in caps is slightly larger, it's at the top of the screen, so that signifies, without me pointing, putting, putting a note on it to say this is the heading, we know where the heading is. There's a, two blocks of paragraph text, and they're set at a slightly different scale of font and a different weight of font, so that signifies this is the body area, and there's a footnote in the very bottom, which if you don't see it, you're not going to be stressed about, but it's a smaller size to give it a sense of a, um, hierarchy and prominence on the slide. Um, but I would say this has been quite an ugly slide, so we can all read it, all right, but it doesn't look very elegant, and that's a word I'm going to kind of tip on a few times. You know, this ticks all the boxes, you know, if you're making a slide deck, but in terms of compelling an audience to remember your slides or to at least give a damn about your message or your presentation or your findings, it doesn't really kind of um, support the argument that you're a trustworthy, uh, dedicated, passionate person that just looks like somebody just chucked this together. So as a graphic designer, I would look at this slide and I would say, well, listen, we, we've got no, directly no white space or no negative space around the text so on the bottom and the top, there's a little bit of white space, but it's kind of hard for the audience to read it. So I would typically move this towards something that maybe looks a bit more like this, whereby, you know, it's still the same message, but it's using a lot more white space to give the reader's eyes a bit more uh, room to just, you know, relax into the slide, you know. Uh, you don't need to shout at people, you don't need to fill the entire slide with the white space. There's a, there was a, a kind of scenario years ago when I was a young designer where I approached a project just like this, and I presented the client with a slide, it was a poster, something similar to this where I had lots of white space to allow the audience or the reader to look at this poster and be able to interpret it in an instant. And the client said to me, I'm not paying you for white space. But unfortunately, you know, the reality is nobody likes to read anything where you're being shouted at because there's no room on the page or on the slide for your eyes to rest, you know. Uh, it's important to have kind of new negative and positive spaces. When I mean positive, it's where the message is, and the negative space is around it, where you can either include imagery or color or whatever it is, but just allow the readers uh, look at the reader's perspective. So they don't feel like they can shout that, you know. So, but, uh, sorry, quick question. I mean, yeah. When you had the picture of Grafton Street, that was that was different. That was like you were using that as a sort of a you fill the screen with that. Yeah. Because I can see immediately looking at this, it is more relaxing to look at. So you're saying when there's content that you need to actually read through, that's when you need the, the space, is what you're saying? Or? Ideally, yeah. Like, you know, like there's some project posters on the wall around here, yeah. and they're kind of, they kind of function almost as a book in a poster, yeah. which is a very tricky space to work in. But if you open any interface, whether it's on your, your iPad or your phone, you know, uh, particularly in the smartphone area here, there's a there's a lot of work goes into fitting dense information into a very small space, you know, and, but the key aspect of that is spacing between content, you know, so that people can interpret where does the next section begin, you know, um, you know, is that text legible? Does it need to be that big? Can it be smaller? You know, there's a lot of nuancing that happens in order to make slides or any interface or a poster or a book work for the reader, you know, there's a reason why there's Oftentimes, a large margin around the printed page, 
it's just, you know, you don't go to the edge for practical reasons because the printed page can be cut and cropped too tight and you, you lose text. Or just the, the reader's uh, eye needs somewhere to rest as it goes from paragraph to paragraph, you know? So, um, like a lot of this stuff, the, the kind of art, typography, and design and layout, um, is the sort of thing that designers and yourselves will, will become good at after time, after creating more and more slides and trying to things to see what works and what doesn't work, you know? Uh, like I always say to design students, Typography and design and layout is, is like being a chef, okay? So when you start in chef college on day one and you go into the kitchen and somebody says, taste that salt, what does it taste like? And, you know, they don't have a general understanding of what it is, but in order, in order to be able to describe it, they need to build up a palette of flavors that they can say, well, salt is, is a base and compared to chili, which is an acid. And you start to develop this language of flavor. And in the same way, Graphic design has a language that designers will use to describe things that most people will consume our work but not know what the language is. So, you know, uh, things like spacing and uh, composition of image with text are things that designers, some designers do but they're not very good at. The best designers do and they make it look like nobody had any involvement in it, so it's invisible to the audience. But people have considered it, you know. This is an example where you might go too far and make your text too small. So there's plenty of people that feel like, oh, listen, lots of white space feels very elegant and clear, and it does, but for you guys then, you probably can't read that, you know, and I can't barely read it. I'm standing at the top of the room. So as I said, there's a scale you work on. Whenever you're creating your, your presentation slides, you know, flick between presenter view and slide view to have a look at how it looks on your screen or on the presentation uh, screen in the room, you know. See if it's feeling a bit too dense, if it's a bit too loud, you know. Because um, I constantly flip between presenter view and slide view when I'm working on slides. So, going back towards something that's maybe a bit more um, realistic, you know, this is this typical slide deck. So, if I was presenting this to a, an audience, I would expect them to fall asleep after 10 seconds, okay? Nobody's going to read all that information there, you know. Um, and oftentimes you have to move through your slides quite quickly. So what you try to do is to highlight the key pieces of information in the slide. You know, you use bolding or you can use color to highlight the points you're making, you know. But again, I would be worried that I might lose the audience with this presentation information. So what you typically do as a presenter is you use the slide to highlight your, to, to be a kind of a, a visual, um, cue for the presenter. You you should know the story ideally, you know. And I, I hope no, none of you are ever in a position where you're told we're going to give a presentation on something you don't know nothing about because that's uh, that's hell on earth and nobody wants to be in that scenario. So thankfully you guys will have been working on projects or campaigns and you should know the story of the uh, the project or campaign from start to finish. You should be able to present it without too much reference on the screen on the screen. So you're in your slide presentation, you're ideally looking for prompts, you know, and these can be in the form of bullets, you know, such as this. And then what you might do in your slide software is, you know, use the presenter view as I'm using here, you know, to um, to include your text. This is the story, the narrative that I'm presenting here, okay? And the slides over here are for the audience just to get a sense of what's going on. But I'm not expecting my audience to start reading this because once they start reading all of this, I've lost their attention, you know. Once the eyes in the room stop looking at me, I might as well be invisible. And that's, again, death by PowerPoint. You know, you need to avoid that. So try and keep your slides very top level if you're presenting your work. You know, um, don't give people things to read because, as I said, you lose the audience. And, and oftentimes people will use slides as a crutch. I've seen lots of presenters stand in the room with their backs to the audience like this, reading, looking back like this, like you're not forecasting the weather, you know. It's, you should know this stuff ideally off by heart. Um, you should understand what you're trying to talk about. And your slides are just to keep your audience engaged in what you're trying to say and to give them breadcrumbs of information that they should hopefully take away. That's the idea of keeping it memorable, you know. So.
So another element that is worth considering is color. So this is your standard starting point for a slide um, in terms of visual color. There's lots of different ways you can you can color your slides, okay? So you can go dark against white. Now, there's one small danger with this kind of presentation, um, and there has been research to prove that white text on a black or a dark background actually visually sparkles and again is slightly more difficult to read for most people, okay? Now there's a kind of new aspect to that whereby a lot of computer interfaces now might use this and you'll see on your, your operating systems they'll give you the dark view for your software or your operating system and it's often to save power on your computer to because the, the device is not actually using as much power to project white light, okay? But typically on a printed page, and as a general rule, I would try and avoid this if possible, unless it's part of the brand um, look and feel and the brand guideline. But it does tend to be more difficult for the audience to read, okay? You can again use colour to signify this might be a sense of urgency you're trying to create using colours from nature, or a sense of danger, you know? Or this could be a sense of this is Irish, you know? Uh, or so could this be, you know? And you're starting to use imagery then. You know, and this is the idea then that you know um, using colour could have cultural connotations for your presentations. You know, so um, but when we talk about then um, moving into looking at pictures and text, which is what I want to talk about now, there's an old adage that a picture's worth a thousand words. Okay, so there's any number of pictures to describe a particular theme. These are just a quick selection of pictures that I picked out this morning around the idea of the climate crisis, okay, so everybody understands what the images are saying, some people might recognise the images, there's photographs here, there's icons as well, they all at a very top level say the exact same thing, but when you're making your presentation, you're not going to be presenting in generalisations, okay, you're typically going to be presenting something that's usually quite specialist, that could be very new, you know, if you're developing a product, or you're developing a concept or a process, you know, you're giving your audience, a kind of, you're dropping a bomb in the room and you're telling them this is a new way of doing things and to express that you need to make sure that the imagery you choose is extremely specific to the concept or the point you're making, okay? So, for example, the image on the bottom left of the hands holding the earth is a bog standard conceptual image montaging ideas, you know, and You'll see thousands and billions of these in the corporate world. They're in slide decks every day. They kind of say lots without saying anything at all. They're so general that they're almost invisible on a slide. I use them all the time because corporate clients of mine tend to just feel comfortable in this space because they tick lots of boxes. But on a human level, if you show people these kind of generic images, you tend to get a lot of disengagement. People lose interest. Okay, so you know, as I said, just. Be careful when you're selecting your images and make sure they're appropriate, you know, and if possible, generate your own images. You all have cameras in your pocket, you know, you're going to be working on physical or conceptual ideas, you know, use your smartphones to record what you're doing and use those images in your slide. There's no issues around copywriting, you know, you'll become a bit of an amateur photographer when you do that, you know, enjoy the process, but capture your images yourself if you can. Or, you know, sketch your concepts on paper and scan the concepts into your presentations, you know. Um, you don't need to go down the route of having professional photographs. You mostly won't have the budgets to do that. And if someday you do get to work on projects where you have photographers on hand to photograph your work or to document your process, great. But there's very few projects in situations where that, that's a reality, okay. Even in the world I work in, and I work with, Corporate clients and government bodies, you know, budgets are tight for generating images and oftentimes to do things on the fly with a phone, you know, or, you know, with a, 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 a hobbled together studio of some sort, you know. So now is, this is the age of the, the image, you know, we all have image devices in our pocket, use them as much as you can. You know, what's important is not necessarily the quality of the image, but what it captures in your message and what it expresses in your story, okay? Um, have, you, have, you, have you seen any of your corporate, your corporate people, as you said, might be a little bit cagey, a bit conservative? There was one student who did a presentation with all his own little sketches, 
Yeah. And, it, and told a story with them, and it was amazing. Yeah. I kind of realized as well, you don't even have to be that good at drawing. You know, and you draw that stick man, and the audience realizes that you've actually drawn it yourself. They're kind of enchanted by it. Have you seen yeah. any, have any of your clients ever really taken that? And have you seen that done? A lot of my clients would be terrified of that scenario right. of going up on a stage, especially if they present to the government or to the, right. uh, yeah. to the industry they're in with sketches. Yeah. But, you know, they ha I have seen them, for example, there's, there's now a trend of these videos that show a hand sketching yeah. a concept that moves across the slide and tells a story. They were initially created by the Royal Society in, in London to tell stories about human evolution and politics and society. Know, and it's now an established style of how to present information. So, you know, there that's not a polished visual, that's yeah. a sketch, you know. Now often oftentimes people use professional illustrators to do that, but there's no reason why you can't express your idea with a series of boxes, with a series of stick people, with a series of arrows and sketches and charts. As I said, some of the most impressive presentations I've ever seen have been on napkins yeah. in coffee shops, you know. You know, it's about creating a connection with your audience, and it doesn't take a lot to usually connect with people. When you show people an image, they are drawn into that image, and they want to interpret what it is, and they want to understand it, and they want to figure it out. You know, there's a reason why you know fashion is so image-based because people look at the images and they want to know who's that person, how do I become what they are? You know, what is it that makes them different? You know, why why is that image so beautiful? You know. The language of imagery is, is really powerful, you know, but it doesn't have to be polished, is what I'm saying. But if you are stuck and you haven't got time to generate images, you know, you can always use, there's, there's libraries out there that will sell you imagery. Some of them are cheap and cheerful. iStockphoto.com, I use it quite a lot. But there's a, my experience, there's a false economy in using these libraries. You know, clients will often say to me, Alan, we have a presentation we need to present. Um, a week on the island of Ireland having a holiday and I can spend four or five hours looking for the right image on these slides whereas you could probably send a photographer out for three or four hours to catch, capture a better image, better quality for a smaller budget because you know my hours are based on my cost based on hourly rates you know so well these images are instantaneous these libraries are instantaneous they're cheap and cheerful they're quick just be aware of the false economy of um, getting drawn down the rabbit hole of spending four hours on my stock looking for an image of a leprechaun you know, because I've been there, you know, so. But there's also other stock libraries. Unsplash.com is a freebie library. People, photographers in particular, upload their images to this library and you can go and get them if you assert your Creative Commons license to that person. And there's good quality image in there, it's just the library's not very big. So for example, if you put in an image uh, search for Dublin, you might get about 100 images, and the lucky all be on Common Street or the Libby, you know. So you can again find yourself going down a rabbit hole with this kind of stuff here. And the danger with image searching and image generation is you get drawn away from focusing on your presentation. And um, so sometimes a quick sketch, you know what it is. You, like I'm sure you know more than half the people in this room don't consider themselves uh, good at drawing. Like that's a fallacy. Everybody can draw. It's just a different scales and different aspects to drawing. And some people believe that unless you can draw a replica of that bottle on the table or a bowl of fruit, then you can't draw. But everybody can at least sketch out a concept. It can just be squares, as I said, triangles, arrows, notes and words. You know, it doesn't matter what it looks like, but once you, you're sure that it's properly reflective of what you're trying to say, that's the most important thing. Okay. Is it still there, still with me? Yeah. You can also use icons to express your concepts. And you see icons on websites and places all the time. There's, again, hundreds of libraries out there where you can buy icons. You can draw your own icons. There's one website, thenounproject.com, which will give you free icons. And there's billions and billions of icons out there on this website alone that you can download for free. So go there if you need to. Um, but just to give you a sense then of how we take the imagery and then bring that back into your presentation and how I use those images in this slide deck. This is this is kind of where a graph design will earn their money, is combining text and images together to make something clear, compelling, and memorable. You know, so if we were to start again with, this is just a piece of content I lifted from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency website this morning. Uh, it talks about the effects of climate change in Ireland, and they give a range of bullet points, that's fine. So that's a text-based presentation of the message 
it ticks the box, but you guys are reading it thinking, yeah, so what, what should I care? Now what you might do is you might say, well, let's bring in some imagery to express this, um, this message, you know, so you can still use your text if you want, and you can incorporate an image into it, and your next point is then support it with another, another image. And again, more images, more text. And this is an improvement on the previous slide, okay? People will remember these images more than they will remember the words you've used to describe the idea, okay? So, that's just another way to say the same thing. The next thing you could use is change that balance completely and change the balance from text-based to image-based. So leave with the images and use condensed prompts to describe each message. You might not even need these kind of piece of text here. That might not be necessary. The image might speak for itself. You know, and the really good presentations generally have very little text on them or no text, you know. If you look at the best presentations ever given, for example, Steve Jobs presenting the iPhone in 2007, there was very little text on the screen. It was often a black stage with a black screen, just an image of an iPhone in the background. And he was speaking to that. He was the focus of attention, and he built a drama around creating this new product. But it wasn't death by PowerPoint with a thousand bullet points or a thousand arrows pointed to the features on the phone. It's just a simple reveal, and it's one of the most memorable presentations ever given, you know. You could go even a, a step further and say, well, listen, rather than cramming everything onto a small slide where all the images have to be reduced in size, you can go full screen and say, well, listen, let's give each slide, each point, an image of its own, and quickly then scroll through it, you know, go from point to point to point to point. This can, again, have a more uh, positive effect in terms of the audience remembering what you're trying to say, okay? It's still the same message. So there's no reason why you have to present thumbnail postage stamp size images on one slide. It might feel like you're being, um, you know, conservative with your use of slides. There's no, there's no limit to the amount of slides you need to use in any presentation. I've seen slide decks that are, you know, 500 slides long for a 20 minute presentation. I've seen slide decks that are 10 slides long for a 20 minute presentation. People often ask me, how many slides do I need to use for a 20 minute presentation? Because there's no number. It's about pacing, you know. So think about how many times you want to click and how, how clear you want to be and how engaging you, you want to make the presentation for the audience, you know. Bigger is better. Give them the cinematic treatment if you can. You know, use your full slide uh, area to present your images. Make the images big and bold if you can, you know, give, give them the best chance of supporting your message. So now we, we get to the really interesting stroke boring stuff, okay? So there's a famous German designer called Dieter Rams. He was responsible for uh, design at the Braun Corporation, which then subsequently inspired the design team at Apple to design the new um, iPhone. Um, he has 10 principles of design. One of his principles is good design is as little as design as possible. So, you know, don't overlay lots of detail on your slides or whatever you're designing. Keep it simple. Distill it right back to what the very essence of the message is, okay? Remove any filigree or detailing that might distract the audience. It might feel like you're, by putting lots of detail in, you're making the slide look like you've been busy. Sometimes it actually gets in the way of the audience trying to see what you're trying to say to them, okay? So here's an example of a typical block of data that I would get from a client to say, can you present this? And this is all fine, but it's basically taking the default visual style from PowerPoint, which, as I said, it ticks the boxes. But if I'm in the audience reading this, I'm going to kind of think this person doesn't really care, or I don't really, I can't remember any of their numbers. So there's simple things you can do to present the same content in a more elegant, refined way and also in a more memorable way. So, you know, for example, you know, have, um, you've got your, your nice um, insight here. This whole slide is about funding of a marketing program, but it's a bit ugly the way that's done. So you can instead just use a simple kind of block of color here to identify the insight that you're trying to point to people. Remember, when you're presenting dense data as well, most audiences don't really give a toss about what the figures were from point A to point B. They would just want to know, what do you think about the figures? What's your insight? What can you tell me that I don't know already? Or what am I missing in this data that I should know? So sometimes you need to highlight, highlight that to people. So be very, very clear visually what that is, you know. 
this is the same content expressed with a chart, okay? So this is all fine. This is the PowerPoint default. Again, it ticks all the boxes, but it's boring and it's ugly as hell, okay? So you might then say, all right, does a bar chart work in this scenario here? So we're presenting marketing budgets in different regions of the world, Asia, Europe, and the United States, okay? But I, I find it difficult to plot the growth of the United States versus the growth of Europe or Asia on this slide. It's all there, but I have to work extra hard to do that. So what I would do in this scenario is I would say, is a bar chart the right type of chart to use? And probably not. I would say instead use a line chart. So now I can see the same data, and I can now see that, all right, there's, there's continuous growth for all markets, but clearly there's a, 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 a disparity of scale of budgets across the various markets. I've also used color as a cultural signifier. So I started with Europe is typically colored blue, as reflected by the EU. And from there, you can say, well, listen, if Europe is blue, the United States might be a competing color. So red would be used for the United States. And you can say blue is the United States, but you also don't have two scales of blue because they compete with each other and you'll create a model. You know? The last thing then, you maybe use yellow to signify Asia, which is a large area of the world. There's no one color that might signify that. So you use a contrasting color again from the blue and the red. You know? They're all small details, but they're all given consideration to make this chart as clear and uh, interesting as possible for the audience. So I won't keep it too much longer. Um, these are just some examples of what I would have done for clients or um, how I would approach typical, typical slides I would have received from a client. So this is kind of typically what you get. You get a whole lot of horrible photographs with some clip art thrown in on a white background with large text. All the typography is really ugly, just really large um, lines and sizes and line weights there. So what you can do with this as a designer is you go in and you say, all right, well, um, you know, bring in some imagery to make it more uh, interesting to people. Ditch the clip art because it's so generic, it won't be remembered by anybody. But this slide talks about a London project, so put a photograph of London in the background. You know, this is a team as well, so the colour photographs all look like individuals sitting in silos who don't talk to each other. So use simple things like put a grayscale or a single colour cue over the images, so it looks like they've all come from the same organization or the same division. Small little cues like this actually help to make the team feel a bit more uh, coherent, you know. Even just the font size as well, like, you know, people can still read the text in the after slide here, even though it's a lot smaller, you know. But it doesn't have to be filled the full slide, you know. You're using a lot more white space, uh, or neg negative space, as I would call it, uh, to just make your slide clearer. Would you ever suggest having everyone on the team in one photo? If you can get that photo, great, but um, we'd always start with, you asked that question? Yeah. So yeah. If you can get that photo, great, but typically they're never in the same room together at the same time, you know, um, uh, so it's, you use what you have. Oftentimes with these projects here, you ask people for a portrait themselves, and it takes two days to get back to you. So you end up going online yourself and find their Twitter profile and you chuck it in there. So that's, it's, it's making sure you keep an eye on the clock. So people often say, can you get a photograph of the entire project team for me? And it's like, well, we won't all be together until next week and the presentation is tomorrow. You just work with what you have, you know? So yeah, it's, it's ideal to get a photograph of everybody together. You know, and it'll do the same job, but reality is often very So difficult. it's not just done like that to look professional, like no. you'd, you'd be, have to present something with a group of the if, team all together. If I could get it, a lot of clients will often have professional photographers come into their head office or whatever to say, we're going to arrange a day of photo shoots and everybody's to wear their best clothes, bring your hair gel, you know, bring your makeup, and they'll set up a mini studio in the corner with a background and lighting and have the photographer set up and they'll schedule people on the conveyor belt to come in, sit for two minutes, like a confirmation photograph. But that rarely happens. And on small products, you don't have a budget to do that, you know. But you know, if you look at any solicitor's website, for example, you'll see they have photographs of everybody taken from the same angle, professionally lit, you know, and that's nice, a nice kind of situation that you can afford to do it for budget reasons or for time, but it's rarely the case, you know. So there's other ways to show somebody on a slide that this team is coherent, they're from the same organization without going to all that trouble of getting everybody in the same room together, you know. And the danger of having group photographs is Mary in the corner left the company two weeks later, and that photograph now is unusable. You 
know. So that's the danger. It's a clever, it's a clever idea. Yeah. Uh, this is another slide then that you might use to present financial data. Could be any data to show growth and uh, peaks and troughs of performance over time. What's important here is that the, the actual important piece of information here is just a mess, you know. So they're, they're trying to highlight particular drops in performance. They have this stock image here, which is great. We know what it is, but it, it's taking up a lot of space. So, and all of this, the detail on this axis of dates is unreadable because of the way the text is aligned. So, what you would typically do here is say, well, isn't there a better way we can at least visualize it, some sort of pattern of dollars and sterling? So, you use a background image of the Queen and George Washington dropped in. Uh, but you give your the imp most important piece of information on the slide as much real estate as possible. So go to full width, you know, and then rather than having these circles that kind of distract the audience from what am I trying to read here, you just use simple shading on the kind of x-axis to show this is a timeline. So it's clearly from 81 to 85 there's a drop in performance in the, the exchange rate there. You can do the you can highlight these things very very subtly. Where you know people tend not to, they tend to get it straight away. You know, try to avoid going into the china shop with a sledgehammer and thinking, well, I've done that. I've highlighted what the, the key information is. Both times it actually trips up the story you're trying to tell. You know. I'm just aware of the, we're kind of near the end. Is it? Yeah. Is there near enough to the end? So yeah. this is another one there. Is there a couple of questions? Is there anyone? Is there any questions? Question or just because I know people have to run across campus. And then, yeah. If there's not, that's fine. I just thought maybe. You all pretty much have PowerPoint on your devices anyway, and you use it regularly. You know, PowerPoint has a bad rap for most people because it's it's like most Microsoft software. It's it's tricky to use. It takes a lot of uh, regular practice to get good at it. But um, it's always keep your your story simple. Start with those sketches uh, that I showed at the start, where you map out your beginning, middle, and end, your chapters. And what I can tell the clients is start with the time schedule you have. So for presentations, you're often allocated. You have 10 minutes, you have 20 minutes to present. Look at TED Talks, they're all based on a 15, 20 minute window. And work to that. So if you've got 20 minutes, you're not gonna go in and present the Bible from New Testament to Old Testament. You know, you're gonna go in and present, all right, I've got very top level stuff to get across here. What's the most important message? You know, prioritize, prioritize, and prioritize. Do you, have, do you have a favorite kind of, I know all these logos exist and survive for a reason, do you have a kind of a favorite or a least favorite sort of design type? For logos, well, if the, the, my favorite logo of all time was killed off about a year ago, which is the Unplus logo, really? which for years and years was the kind of franking stamp yeah. symbol that was clear on the back of green postage vans with a, a Celtic unit, uh, Uncio font, the S and the T joined up. Okay. And they, they ditched all that, you know, and it was in existence for about 20, 30 years. Okay. Uh, it was part of our cultural identity, but that's been ditched for something more modern that in a boardroom ticks all the boxes, but you know, as a human being, I think it's lost a lot of the story and a lot of the humanity of it. The least, fa least favourite. I'm oh, sorry? The least favourite. Least favourite logo or design, piece of design. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say I have one in particular. I think I could see all the. You know, as a young designer, I used to look at everything with very harsh critical eyes and say, that's rubbish. Look at the Ryanair website as it used to be. I think that's a piece of garbage. But every project, like you guys will know yourself, has challenges and clients that you have to persuade. And there's politics in every particular project you work on. So, you know, the best designer in the world with a bad client or a tough brief, it's very hard to create a crystal goblet from that. You know, a piece of work in crystal. There's always challenges. So I, I'm very empathetic to any design product that gets they get slated or like it's a hard time in the press because it's oftentimes because there's been a lack of briefing or a lack of budget or a lack of time to do it, you know. It seems there's lots of, you know, particularly now, there's no room for escape if you're presenting something and it's not done properly because it'll be recorded and shared on social media and analyzed and critiqued by every Joe So who has a device, you know, and it's it's kind of it's harsh. So yeah. Okay, I think we're probably all the time, and yeah, yeah. Other questions. If, you, if you have any questions, I don't think you can ask them straight out for anyway, but otherwise, uh, thanks for that. And thanks for yeah. the Thank you. Thank you.